Hey everybody, this is Jay Mack from RouterDogs.com and today we're going to be talking about feasible and reported distance in EIGRP. Now for some reason this always seems to be a very complicated issue with a lot of my CCNA students and <laughs> it could be because I get tongue-tied when I talk about it or it could just be the crazy way that Cisco has named this kind of stuff so hopefully this will kind of clear it up for you. Alright, now Feasible distance is the lowest cost path from your router to the destination. So in other words, it's what the local router sees. So router 1 sees a path to router 5. His best path would be the feasible distance. All right, now, reported distance. Reported distance is what the neighboring routers refer to as your feasible distance. So in other words, after you find your feasible distance to R5, you would then report that to other routers. So your feasible distance gets reported to the other routers. So reported distance is the feasible distance of other routers, and feasible distance is your best distance to the destination site. So really, it's the exact same thing but it depends on how you're looking at it. So for example here, my son might call me dad, but his friends call me JMac. So I'm the same person, but I get called different names depending on the perspective. And it does, it gets kind of confusing. So let's take a look at that from the different perspectives. All right, here, if this is R1 and R2, and they're both trying to get to the destination here, R5. I threw some uh, different path costs on here. So from R1 to R5, his obviously his best path is a distance of 5 and a distance of 5. So his total distance is 10. So his best route to R5 has a, a distance of 10. So that becomes his feasible distance. So from R1, he says, hey, my best path is straight to R3 to R5 and has a feasible distance of 10. Now, R2, from his perspective, he looks at it, if he goes to R6, to R4, to R5, then he's got 3, 5, which is 8, plus 5, so he has a feasible distance of 13. But if he goes from R2 and goes to R1, R3 here, he has a feasible distance of 14. So in his case, his feasible distance is 13. But when he sends that to R1, R1 records it as the reported distance of R2. Does that help at all? So really, R2 has a feasible distance of 13. R1 has a feasible distance of 10. So they both have a feasible distance. They both have a best route or best cost to get to R5. But when R2 sends that to R1, R1 records that as the reported distance. Now, why is it different? Because there's a condition later on that kind of meet, takes both of these two different numbers um, and puts them together, and that's why they have to kind of be named differently, if that helps at all. So just make sure at this point you understand that from your router, or from the local router, however you want to look at it, the best path to the destination is the feasible distance and anybody else's feasible distance that gets told to you is referred to as reported distance. So reported distance is always what's reported from a neighboring router and feasible distance is always your best path, your best cost. Now at this point it's not too bad to understand but now here's where it gets weird. The feasible distance is actually assigned to a successor route. A successor route is your best path to a destination and the successor route would show up in the routing table. But the reported distance is assigned to the feasible successor and a feasible successor would show up in the topology table kind of as a backup route. So here's what a little topology table would look like, um, just this one of the network destinations. Uh, and we're going to explain this uh, by the different line types here in just a second. But at this point, just make sure you're good with the feasible distance is assigned to the successor route, and the reported distance are assigned to feasible successors. And moving that, and getting worse. So the successor is the lowest cost route to a destination, and that route again gets placed in the routing table. The feasible successor is a backup route or secondary route that meets the feasibility condition. 
and we'll talk about that in just a second. But the feasible successor is not in the routing table. He gets placed in the topology table. Remember, EIGRP has three tables. It has a routing table with the successor routes, the best path to the destinations. It has a topology table, which is the backup paths to destinations. And then it has a neighbor table, which we'll talk about in a different video. So successors show up in the routing table. Feasible successors show up in the topology table. All right, let's talk about that feasibility condition again. The feasibility condition says, in order to be a feasible successor, the route must have a reported distance that is less than the feasible distance. So here's why they named them something different. We can't just say that the reported distance is actually R2's feasible distance um, because then this it would be really hard to map this out. But we can say if we call it, if everything get that gets reported we call reported distance, then we can make this condition work. So, in order to be a backup route and be listed in the topology table, the reported distance has to be less than my feasible distance. So your first question is, why does there have to be a condition? Why don't we have all the possible backup routes um, from one point uh, from our network you know, in our router? Well, the reason is, one, it would create um, uh, routing loops, which are bad. Uh, second thing is it would also fill up our routers with so many secondary routes that are kind of worthless uh, and it would take a whole lot of more processing power, memory, things like this. So it would slow our network down considerably. So between routing loops and the slowness factor that you would get, we don't want that. We only want good backup routes. All right, so let's talk about that topology table again. Now, here is one entry from the topology table. So in order to get to this network, 172.17.0030, it says there's one successor. So if it says there's one successor but there's two entries, the second entry must be the feasible successor. So your topology table will also list the successor routes as the first route. And they'll show, it'll tell you the feasible distance is blah, 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 4560. And then here for the primary route, He's got four, five, six, zero. So in order to be a feasible successor, his reported distance, the second number, must be lower than the feasible distance. So in this case, he's three, five, six, zero, which is less than four, five, six, zero. So he does become a secondary route or a feasible successor. So in your topology table, you'll have a bunch of destination networks you'll have at least one successor because there has to be a path to get there. Um, and then if there's other entries, they may be feasible successors or they may be equal cost load balancing paths or something like that. So you want to look, if this case had just had two entries and said two successors, we would have load balancing. But it doesn't. It says one successor. So here's the, the first one is usually the successor. And then everything else underneath that has to be a feasible successor, if that helps. All right. So what happens if a route does not meet the feasibility condition? Let's look at that. All right, back to our topology table. So from R2 to R5, he has a reported distance of 13. But from R1 to R5, we have a feasible distance of 10. So the feasible, we're, gonna, we're looking at it from R1's perspective. The feasible distance is 10, but the reported distance is 13. This means that R2 will not, the path from R2 to R6 to R4 to R5 will not show up in the topology table. And it will not become a feasible successor. Now, that does not mean that R1 will never use that path. If for some reason this link here goes down or this link here goes down, and R1 no longer has a path to R5 this way, what will happen is R1 will then send queries out and say, hey, I don't have a path to R5. Who does? Well, R2 would respond and say, hey, I have a path and it has a distance of 13. Well, at that point, R1's got to make a decision. I either can't get there or I can get there through a distance of 13. So he's going to take the distance of 13 so that path would show up then. So just because a route doesn't show up as a feasible successor does not mean your router won't use it. It just means your router won't list it as an immediate backup path. Um, but if there's a problem and he needs it, he will request that and he will get it and then he will use it, if that makes sense. 
But again, don't forget, it's always a matter of perspective. So when you look at these things, you have to remember where you're looking at them from. In this first example we just talked about, we looked at it from R1's point of view. But if I change this, and now we look at it from R2's point of view, R2's best path is a, has a feasible distance of 13, and he goes to R6, to R4, to R5. But R2 has a reported distance of 10, because he can get there, there, there. But R2 can't go R1, R3, R5, because then his distance would be 14. So in R2's case, he can either go right or he can go left. If he goes right, he has a distance of 13, which is lower, so that becomes his feasible distance of 13. But R1 has a reported distance of 10, because 10 is lower than the feasible distance of 13. The path to R1 would show up in the topology table for R2. And then if for some reason this path here between R2 and R6 broke, R2 would immediately go to his topology table, find the backup path listed, the feasible successor, and then he would start sending data this way you know, without having to send queries and get information back from all of his neighbors. So that's why the topology table is in there, so that we can make decisions very fast um, and have a faster convergence. If not, then I have to send queries, I have to wait for the replies to come back. There's always there's a stuck and active issue that we'll talk about in another video, but it, it can take a lot longer. It can take three to four minutes to converge my network if a link breaks, if I don't have those uh, routes in my topology table. But if we're in the topology table, the stuff happens pretty fast, um, and most of the time users won't even notice the difference. So again, it's all a matter of perspective. From R1's perspective, R2 would not show, his path would not show up in the topology table. But from R2, R1's path would because he meets the feasibility condition. His reported distance is less than the R2 feasible distance. All right, so theoretically, if our network's designed right, that's how everything would work. But remember I also mentioned that um, the topology table and the feasibility condition helps us to prevent routing loops. Let me show you a quick example of that. All right, don't make fun of my drawing, but you get the idea. So we're on R1, and we're sending to R5. Now, R2's reported distance, no matter what, is always going to be higher than R1's feasible distance because he has to add this in addition to this and this. And R3's distance is always going to be higher than R1's because he has to add this path to this to this. So R1's always going to have a faster path to R5 than R2 and R3. So R2 and R3 would never want to be kept as a backup route because they would just create a routing loop. If R1 to try to get to R5 would send to R2, then R2 would send what back to R1 and you, then you got this route, let's just keep going back and forth. You don't want that. Or if you sent to R3 and then R3 would send to R2 and R2 would send to R1, you, again you get this routing loop. So that's why the feasibility condition is there. One, to speed convergence up and have some backup paths. Two, to prevent routing loops like this from occurring. And we do have stuff like this in our networks because we want redundancy and we do have redundant links. Um, in case a link goes down, you know, we don't, our network doesn't go out. So that's the big thing about the feasibility condition and the feasible successors and successors. Prevent routing loops and to improve our convergence speed. All right, one more point I want to make. The feasibility condition states that in order to be a feasible successor, you have to have a reported distance less than the feasible distance. Okay, so your reported distance has to be less than the feasible distance. So when you look at these topologies, and this is what they try to do to trip you up on the CCNA, they want to check your understanding. So here's two different networks that we can get to uh, in our topology table. They both say one successor, but the CCNA will ask you which one of these would not show up in the topology table. Um, so if we look, the feasible distance or the feasible distance here is listed as 20514560. So if I go to the reported distance, now remember the first one is the successor. So that's the feasible distance showing up there. Okay. The second number, the second entry, his second number over here is his reported distance. So the reported distance of the feasible successor has to be lower than the feasible distance. So in this case, he ends in 3560. 3560 is smaller than 4560. So this reported distance is less than this feasible distance or this feasible distance, however you want to look at it. So this first one would show up in the topology table. 
but if we look at this second entry, the feasible distance is 30720. So here's your successor route with his distance of 30720. And then the feasible successor shows up as 30720. Now, that is not less than the feasible distance. It is the same as the feasible distance and that doesn't work. So it does not meet the feasibility condition. So this second route here would not show up in the topology table because his reported distance here is not less than the feasible distance. So don't let that one trip you up. Just make sure you understand that feasibility condition. In order to be a feasible successor or backup path, your path must have a reported distance less than the feasible distance. All right, hope that helps and hope that explains it to you. Um, again, I've got a, a detailed guide on routerdogs.com. So routerdogs.com is our CCNA, CCNP blog that we're just starting. Um, anytime the, the, some of our students have some issues, we're going to try to post some stuff up here, um, a, a guide about the topic, some tips and tricks, um, video guides as well, just like this one here, um, and information about the coming CCNA changes. Um, Cisco is reworking all of their uh, certifications. Uh, they're starting now with CCNA and that'll go live. Uh, they At this point they plan on having the whole the book series done by the end of 2013. So by January 2014, that's their target date, uh, they should theoretically be able to provide a new CCNA you know, exam. Now, some of the updates and stuff that are coming up, like IP6 having a greater role, um, and multi-area OSPF. And again, we'll start talking about these throughout the rest of the year um, and get some information on you on the site. So again, stop by routerdogs.com. Um, and if you've got some certain CCNA or Cisco topic that you want us to talk about or maybe make clearer for you, um, just send us an email and, and we'll get it up there for you. All right, guys, good luck and happy routing.